Hello and welcome to another episode of The Novel Brain with Dr. E. Today I'm going to be describing the concept of surge capacity. And if you're feeling exhausted or depleted, perhaps even depressed, this may be the concept that explains why you feel the way that you do. So stay tuned for more. So tomorrow is the first day of September, and after a brief hiatus from the novel brain, I've had a little bit more time to kind of reflect on where this has been and where we're going with this pandemic. And one of the things as a psychologist I have to really examine is how resilient are people. And my last episode did outline some factors with resiliency. And as you may know by now, I particularly work with children and families and communities and do try to help in areas um, of poverty, homelessness, and disaster. And today's topic happens to be exactly from a researcher out of the University of Minnesota who studies resilience in developing systems, risk and protective factors of children and families in all of these areas. So I'm gonna try to apply some of her work with what surge capacity may mean in a time of a pandemic. So in my own work with resilience, I reached back into some of the things that I saw from not only her lab in the University of Minnesota, but what might be out there. And really, there's not a whole lot out there. But before we get started, we have to define what surge capacity is. So it is a collection of adaptive systems, mental and physical, um, emotional even, that humans draw on for short-term survival in acutely stressful situations, such as a natural disaster. But as we know, natural disasters occur over a shorter period, even though they may have longer-term recovery. Um, they typically end. And what we're in with the pandemic is sort of the non-ending, the unknown. So we have to examine what's happening to our resilience when we have a sense of doom or panic, anxiety, and fear added to what may occur on our normal level basis. So I came across in some of the research and resilience this article, and it's just a medium article, but it's a really well-written piece. And for those of you who have shared this from my uh, social media posts in the past 24 hours or so, Thank you. I mean, I think most people are sort of wondering why they're feeling the way that they do. And this this article did sort of outline um, why you may be feeling that and what you can do about this. So it was written by Tara Holly, and she identified Dr. Ann Maston as somebody she was interviewing. Um, and she did talk about some of the early stages of COVID-19 seclusion. And if you can remember that, it depends on where you were in the world, but for for me in North America, and if you're listening in this region, that was roughly early March to mid-March of 2020. And so when we're moving into this, we have to identify that for other places, you know, the COVID virus has been something that is very much the same wherever you are. It, It really just affects people on a different level depending on where you are in exposure. But I just want to talk a little bit about the current sort of major problems that we're handling and why this sort of compounding idea of surge capacity can be difficult for some. We have a major pandemic across the globe. We also have political conflict, not just in the United States, but other countries, as we know and as we see every day on social media. We have racial unrest and we have social economic issues to a degree that we hadn't seen since maybe even starting since the 70s. So we have to ask ourselves some questions. And this is what resilient science is. Um, they factor into about three different areas. And the first area is how is it that some children and families experience adversity and do so much better than other families that have also faced the same adversity? Secondly, what protects or helps children when they face this type of adversity? And that's what researchers are looking into finding to try and help. 
And then what can we learn to promote resilience in younger children? So if you think about your own adaptivity to this pa pandemic, we also have to really take in consideration where we are with our grief stages. And I'm gonna get into that when we talk about what it is that we can do. So we all have different levels of grief that we're in, but at the same time, we have to understand that resilience is not necessarily a trait. It is something that can be learned. And with the malleable science in neurodevelopmental brain development is that we could really work on a skill that helps us to become more resilient. So I'm not from the school that it's a trait. It's more of something that we have that we can build on and that we can actually challenge ourselves to get better with. So there's a lot of hope in this. And so for you overachieving and anxious types, which happens to be my sort of um, personality traits, this can be very difficult. We like to solve problems. We like to get things done and we like to move forward with routines. Um, we might be setting into some degree after six months of quarantine of some degree of helplessness or hopelessness, which is not serving you. So before we move on, we need to look at that and then try to see how we can face this problem for now that has no solution. We have to take into context where we are right now and that life as we know it, at least within the past century, has been changed and is different now and forever. So Mastin would say, why do you think you should be used to this by now? Because we are all beginners at this. This is a once in a lifetime experience. It's expecting a lot to think we'd be able to manage this really well at this time. So it's time for us to get, give ourselves a break. And for those of you who are very hard on yourself, as I mentioned, this could be the overachiever, potentially the anxious type, really need to kind of let go of that. If possible, think about how much of this you have no control over. And accept that life is different now. What else can we do? Well, it's identify that we can give ourselves permission to expect less from ourselves. This is tough for some of us, as I said, and just understand that this malaise that we feel around us is something that's very common to everyone. And there are support systems that have been there in place this whole time. It's just in a different way. I know that we're all virtual now and that we're all looking at how we can handle this in person, but we really can't. We have to look at this as technologically, we have a silver lining where we have methods that we can connect without having to be in person and possibly endangering other people or ourselves. What else can we do? And the outline has definitely made me think about this. Um, when I read through the article, I agreed with all of it. And that's why I wanna share some of the uh, different things that we can do. So recognizing the different aspects of grief, as I mentioned earlier, you gotta kinda of see where you are. And I've done a podcast on this before. Um, there are folks in denial, they're in anger, they may be bargaining, they're in depression, or in their, maybe even in acceptance of this. I would suggest to be at least in an acknowledgement that we should accept this as best we can. But don't deny that you might have some depression or anger or anxiety. I think that denial is really something that could be very damaging at this time um, for you and others because this is a time that's unlike any other time that we don't know. This is why it's called the novel coronavirus. And this is why it's called the novel brain is because we don't know what we're getting into. We're just trying to examine it as we move forward. And one of the things that um, the article identified really well is sometimes acceptance means that you need to say that we're gonna have as good of a time as possible despite this or in spite of this. So think about how many times you've gone into something fearing that it's gonna be horrible and then it turned out to be one of the best things you've ever done 
perhaps in your life, and maybe they're even the top three things you've ever done, and it was something that you were so fearful of, and you just decided, I don't want to do anything with that. So know that you have to take it and approach your life still with some vigor, and that you could still have some amazing times, and maybe some of the best times ever. And I'm speaking for myself now, because in the past six months, I have found a different Dr. E. I've found things within this super gray area that have really enlightened me to become a different person. And some of you may be thinking, is that your approach towards the silver lining you always talk about? Or is that just your mentality? Well, a lot of this is because I'm identifying where I am at all times. And I'm just coincidentally also thinking about my calibration level of where I want to be. Do I want to be stuck in some stage or aspect of grief? Or do I want to move forward? And the science says that we really need to try and move forward as best as we can. All right, next up, I want to talk about um, you experiencing and also experimenting with something called the both and thinking. And this approach may not work for all of you, but it's thought that there's this alternative to binary thinking that many people find helpful in dealing with ambiguous loss, such as the times that we're in right now, the loss of seeing your family and friends, the loss of regular events that are commemorations to your life, graduations, and first this and that, and weddings, and all these things we've lost. So we're looking at both and thinking to be helpful in a sense where that if you stay in the rational when nothing else is rational, like right now, then you'll just stress yourself out more. So one of the things you can do with both and thinking is say this. Maybe the scenario is that you're fearful of your elderly parents dying. So if we're not really certain about what might be happening or maybe they're sick right now, we could be saying, my father is both living and maybe he's also struggling. Or maybe my mother has some very big difficulties, but maybe she does not and she's thriving. So this is the thought. And as well as looking at that way, we want to take a look at the situation as pathological and not the person. So it's not you. It is this worldly situation that we have to get behind and not beat ourselves up and to thinking that we're not doing enough and that we are the ones that are in charge here and I have to figure this out. Um, for you overachievers and you anxious types, maybe you avoidant types as well. This is something that we do not have a whole lot of control over. So consider that, the both and thinking. Of course, you can't go through any article and any kind of talk about COVID at this time and how to relieve ourselves of a lot of the problems by not coming across something that asks you to look for activities, both new and old, that continue to fulfill you. I can't stress this enough. This is absolutely true. This is a time for us to challenge ourselves as to our own coping. But what is it that we do on a daily basis really is who we are. So if we think we're doing a whole lot, but we're really just kind of armchair quarterbacking at home and we're on social media for 19 hours a day, that's really not doing a whole lot, folks. It's great that you're trying to stay informed, but you're not doing much. So it's the activities, it's the doing that I'm going to just urge you to do. It's the self-care. Um, I recently started a regimen every day where I drink a liter of water very first thing I do every morning. And now it's by, it's on my bedstand, And so I can't get around it. And it's become not only a pattern that I hope becomes you know, a habitual pattern, but it's something that I look forward to, oddly, after about the first 10 days. I also have dipped back into the self-care of exercise on a minimal level, probably, but actually stepped it up a little bit more in the past four months because it is something that not only takes my mind into a different mind-body sort of component, it also not just distracts me, but makes me start thinking in terms of now I can kind of move forward and really work on me without really 
having to think about what's going on around me all the time, which is something that I don't have really that much control over. So the mind-body component puts me into this, now it's time for me to just take action for myself. This is something I can do for me. And it's proven to be something that's helpful. As well, as well as nutrition, folks. Just like to me, I think I've said this before, you know, hitting the grocery store was a little bit stressful there during the first three months of COVID times. But now I'm back to this whole, like, I love going to the grocery store. Even though it's challenging, I am nurturing myself. And everything that I put in my basket and eventually into my bags that come home with me is self-care. All right, so the next step is that I want you to focus on maintaining and strengthening all those relationships that are important to you. And maybe some of us have kind of fallen away because of whatever reason, and it's not easy. We can ask ourselves maybe that was maybe a healthy move, but perhaps it might just be because of the times. So, you know, we just be honest with the people that we know in our lives, our friends and family, that something might be going on with you or something might be um, needed for you to reset before you actually kind of enter into any kind of relationship with them again. But I do think, again, in this time of innovative technology, use it. It's really important. Try and begin slowly building your resilience bank account. Because as I said earlier, with compounding things that occur that we have no control over, like hurricanes, California wildfires, typhoons in the Pacific, and perhaps even like the death of a loved one or a friend. This is something that we're not going to be ready for. And have you ever heard anybody say, oh, I knew this was coming on August 31st. I knew this was happening at 7 a.m. Yeah. No, that doesn't happen. These kind of major things and catastrophes that happen and disasters that occur in our lives that do changes forever are almost always something that take us by surprise. So one of the things that I do, and I think that I can try and hopefully urge you to do, is just like take a look and focus on your sleep, on your exercise, as I mentioned, of course, that nutrition, and then also have components in your life that have you look further in as to out. So these are sort of the meditative practices, the transformative practices, these are the things that I'm asking you to kind of look and self-reflect on. Take a look at your self-awareness. How compassionate are you? Are you not happy with yourself because you aren't? Um, Where are you with your gratitude? And again, how do you connect with others? And can you say no? I'm just going to say this out loud. Um, You have taken on a lot oddly, of more positions in a time of COVID-19 as opposed to not taking on work positions. But at the same time, I felt the need to try and help others. But at the same time and with the same breath, I want you to look at yourself and examine whether you can take on anything more at this time. And it's okay to say no if you can't. So know that within yourself. And also build that resilience bank account, people. It's important for you and everyone around you. So lastly, I just want to take perspective. And I want to thank the author of this article. She did this really great job. Again, those of you who shared this on social media, thank you. I think it's important for everybody to read it. It's called Your Surge Capacity is Depleted. It's Why You Feel Awful. And it does discuss the research out of the University of Minnesota. But it also just has you think about where you are And that's where I want to end this with, your perspective. You have gone through a life-threatening illness. Now you're facing a sometimes very slow recovery and this physical, emotional, or cognitive abilities that you have are going to be slow to return. So what I want you to think about is that pandemics are different than other disasters in the sense where we don't know the end of this and it's going to be stretching itself out potentially indefinitely and this is anxiety provoking accept that embrace that and know we all don't know what's going to happen you can really just kind of base yourself as to what you can do for yourself and your loved ones i want you to also just take this time to acknowledge that we have all lost something and it's so important in this time to acknowledge the things that we've lost, the time that we've had with others. We look back to 2019 and how we were just 
so depressed, but why? I don't know, because, you know, if you think about it, things were pretty good. We were in front of each other without having to worry about getting other people sick or picking up some kind of virus. So it's all perspective, folks. What we have lost, we can lose again. Things are things, but people are people and feelings are real. Try not to hurt each other on the process and understand that things cannot be perfect. And they are not going to be perfect at this time. So consider your perfection scale and where you are in that spectrum, folks. And think about maybe recalibrating your idea of perfect and accepting that I'm really not sure who is perfect right now. People online seem perfect, but I, I, you know, I question that daily. So maybe you should too. Last up, I want you to remember, and this is something that people have talked about over and over, but it is your joy and your fulfillment that ultimately drives you to the next day. So think about who and what brings that to you. Are they people? Are they events? Are they things that you do for yourself? Is it that time that you give yourself? Is it you serving yourself to your best being? That's ultimately the goal of the novel brain. And I hope that you can take this away with this episode. And I really hope to see you on the next one. Um, So we're looking at doing a weekly at this time and getting back into the routine. So do stay tuned for more of the novel brain with Dr. E. Be well all. Thank you.